Hi, folks, this is Lewis Hertham, the original Peter Abernathy. Hell is empty and all the devils are here on the Shadow TV Westworld podcast with Roger, Gene, and Big D. Welcome back to Shad on TV Westworld, the unofficial podcast companion piece to the hit HBO show Westworld. I'm one of your hosts, Gene Lyons. Alongside me is my co-host, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. So this is our deep dive edition where we look back on this week's episode of Westworld and provide our thoughts and analysis. Uh, You heard our Instacast Sunday night immediately after the show. Our Telegraph comes on Friday where we read viewer and listener mail. Uh, But this one is just diving deep into the topics that we discussed on Sunday and there are lots of them to get really deep into. This was a slower episode, uh, episode eight, Kiksuya. It focused mainly on the memories of Akicheta, the first of his kind. And I misjudged Big D. I thought the fan reaction was going to be very negative for this one, uh, in contrast to us loving it. But the fan reaction has been overwhelmingly positive. So bravo, Westworld. Yeah, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, again, you know, there, there's been some decline in the numbers of of, uh, you know, of week over week of viewers. So maybe the ones that are left are the truly devoted and maybe the ones who would appreciate uh, the story that they're telling. But yes, uh, kudos to you, fans of Westworld. I'm glad you weren't there just for the uh, for the nude bodies and uh, robot violence. Right. There were a few dissenters that said you could have slipped this stuff into just 10 minutes of a bigger episode. But I think we've had a lot of matters of science. We've had a lot of matters of mystery. This one was an episode that was matters of the heart. And it did touch on some other deeper topics that we'll get into on this podcast, including Maeve's mode of communication and which way that was working when in communicating with Akicheta, um, Ford's journey in tonight's speech and what that was all about. Basically, this episode really reflected back on that uh, and the events uh, preceding that. Also, what exactly was going on with Logan? In the Instacast, we had some ideas, but now after a little bit of research, uh, consulting with some of our uh, medical expert friends and listeners, we got a better idea of what's going on there. And really, what was the heart of this episode is that that evolution of consciousness. Uh, we saw a different development of consciousness from the the typical loops that we had been examining for you know nearly two years now. And we're going to kind of look at that and see and see what this episode had to say about all those things. Yeah, a lot to uh, to delve into this episode, uh, and and for the ones who possibly didn't like it, uh, I just ask: When's the last time that this show made you truly care about a character so much? The emotional component is the core of the story. We're supposed to feel for the hosts. We're supposed to feel for the cast that we love. And some of the middle episodes where we felt we had a little lost, it was a lack of that emotional connection. And they stress that here, and it starts right off the bat. So I think that's a possibly a great way to start here with Maeve and, and the conversation. Yeah. So a little bit of housekeeping before we get into the the deeper, meatier parts of this episode. A lot of listeners like Bonnie and Jeff uh, wrote to us very gently, very kindly, and said things like, I'm a huge fan. I love your dedication doing three episodes a week. You helped me understand this show better. But I've got a little problem with the way that you're pronouncing Akchetta. Well, I have had a history, and I'm bad at it, uh, of, of mispronouncing names. And I think one of the big one was Bernard. So we have a little history of this, but I, this one squarely falls on the shoulders of Roger, doesn't it? Well, in Roger's defense, he came up with the pronunciation before we'd ever heard the name. We'd only seen it in print, and a lot of people can make that mistake. But the e- the email that really triggered a need to address this on the podcast uh, came from Ainsley, listener Ainsley, who wrote, For the love of all that is holy, learn to say Akicheta before you record again. Your constant rinse pronunciation is both grating and... And feels disrespectful. So I went back and and watched the episode again, key parts where they were speaking to him in dialogue. And I noticed that the tribe seems to pronounce it Akecheta, and Ford calls him Akicheta, Kawana uh, calls him Aki. So what what do you think we should go with, Big D? Aki is the easiest because there's no doubt. I tried to write it out phonetically, uh, and I I know I'm going to continue to butcher it. Because it's almost impossible when you have a conversation on a podcast and it's just a, 
you know, a fluid, you know, chain of thought of consciousness that you're just going back and forth. I'm going to butcher it. So I'm going to stay with Aki. Yeah, Aki seems like an easy one. So from now on, we can agree it's Gremily, it's Aki, it's Escalante, it's Las Mudas, and we can just move on. Well, the only thing that makes me feel a little uncomfortable is that that was Koana's you know, nickname, like a term of endearment. I, I feel a little odd calling uh, this, this feared warrior by his loving, cuddly name, like Pookie. Well, I think I think the scene that we saw with him in the chair and the tears rolling down his eyes, we all bonded with Aki at that point, and he's family now. So, I think I think Aki is the way to way to go. I'm on board. All right. So we said during the Instacast that there was clearly communication going on between Maeve, her daughter, and Aki, uh, but it was really hard to tell directionally what was going on there. Again, that was af- immediately watching after watching the episode. Um, several listeners wrote in to talk about how it was Maeve commuting through her daughter to Akicheta, Aki. Uh, you almost did it again. Yeah. And, and, uh, and listener Kelsey even woke me up, uh, Monday morning with this barrage of texts. Like you under, you guys caught that, right? It was, she was talking through her daughter. So do you think we have a better picture now after, after watching again of what's going on there? Well, I went back and I, this time had time to stop and and write down the conversation. I don't know that I agree. It's it's Maeve communicating through the daughter as it, it jumps back and forth. The first time that we we get a hint that Maeve is communicating, you know, out externally from her body is uh, when when Aki comes across the man in black in, in the river and he says in English, "I remember you." Uh, it then cuts to Maeve in the Mesa with Sizemore, her eyes are fluttering. Uh, So we understand that we're seeing a kind of a projected vision. Uh, So I think it goes back and forth. Sometimes Aki speaks for Maeve, then cuts into Lakota and he's speaking for himself. Then he's speaking in English to the daughter. So I don't think there's a clear definitive line as to when it is who's speaking, only the times that the dialogue is specific to the character. So I was working today to put down on paper what it is that I thought was going on after after rewatching the scenes, and I noticed an email from a listener, uh, Jason Stollery, which I thought summed up my thoughts completely, and he wrote it beautifully. He says, uh, I think the basis of Aki's story is actually for Maeve, not the daughter. I believe that when she's connected to the network, she reaches out and watches her daughter, and he detects that. His use of language is a clue as well. When he speaks to the daughter, it is in English, but when he's speaking to Maeve, he is doing so in Lakota. We know that Maeve can speak Lakota based on the previous episode, but no indication that the daughter can. When he tells her that they're meant for the same path, she tells him that his leads back to hell, so he wants to explain his real story. He tells the daughter in English that she saved him and gave him a light to continue on. This also explains to Maeve the connection that Aki has with her family through the daughter. He speaks of misunderstanding intentions during the confrontation at the homestead, and that, in essence, is why he wants to ensure that she doesn't lose her one love as he did. This is why when Maeve tells her daughter in the flashback that she will protect her, Aki says in Lakota that that's a promise she couldn't keep, so he kept watch on her. It makes sense now why they kept flashing a Maeve on the table off and on, because she was listening to the story. And when she repeats the phrase, take my heart when you go, she's acknowledging his story and that she understands and wishing him to protect her heart, her daughter. It's an important phrase to him that he probably mentioned several times. We should remember that the characters are hearing more than just the narration because we get the benefit of seeing the story. I also don't think that she can control or read Aki at all based on what seems like her inability to control woke hosts, and he seems to be wokest of all. There's also a scene where in there where where Aki is directing his his dialogue to the daughter, and he says, "They took her from me again." He's describing Koana. I saw through their lies. I would find her, but first I had to face the journey before me. You know the journey I mean. Do you think that's the journey that Maeve has taken to find her daughter, or the journey that Maeve took from the the park, the the above ground Westworld? down into the uh, below and into the workings of the park? Which journey do you think he's referencing? I mean, I'm not sure, Big D. Actually, that's a really good question. Do you have any ideas on it? 
at first I took it that it was the journey to find missing love. But the, the subsequent scenes is, is when Aki is out, he goes back to the village. He has a conversation with uh, the, the other elder female Lakota member about the ghost that she remembers they've been replaced. She references the, the I think they call them the, the ones from below and how in the religion, some of the Lakota members wish they were visited. Some don't. They're not sure some will return. At that point, he said he knew where to go. Uh, and that was, he allows himself to be stabbed by the cowboy, and he goes down into the body shop. Due to the sequence of it, I, I think we're meant to, on the surface, believe it's the search for love, because that's what the episode's about. But the journey was to find out what was really going on in the park and the way to uh, expand your abilities and knowledge. Also, to touch on a point, I love that they took that moment with the stabbing to really focus on something that we've kind of lost sight of in season two, because we've seen so little of the humans uh, mistreating the hosts. It it was great to see a callback to season one again of these guys, they got the gun pulled, then they got the opportunity to to attack uh, Aki uh, unarmed as he puts his blade away and and, and his friends, you know, encouraging him and he goes for the, the most... Uh, a gruesome killing of all, right? The gut stab. And again, I think that that's important to insert that. It was very brief, but it was very critical to show, A, the sacrifice he's willing to make and knowing that that's what a human will do to him, and B, to remind us that there was a time just recently when the tables were turned and the hosts were not the the apex predator and that and there was a history of their mistreatment. Yeah, and I think there's an interesting parallel that we start to see between Aki and, and Maeve. Aki, we've always wondered, what was it that triggered Maeve's uh, awakening? Because she never heard the reverie. She never heard the, uh, you know, these these delights. What was it that triggered? And it turns out it was Aki trying to help her in return for the daughter saving him in his moment of need, that she, he wanted to give her the truth. But in, you know, the human or Western culture, the truth is obviously sometimes misunderstood. So he gives her the maze symbol. That obviously starts her on her path to when the daughter is killed. That was the trigger. So it's nice to see they're learning each other's shared history. And as you see that bond forming in this conversation, it's finalized and sealed with this beautiful moment where Maeve seems to be entrusting the care of her daughter to Ghost Nation, realizing that this may be it for her. Uh, she must believe that she's not coming out of this lab, that that her her moments are numbered. And letting go of that, seeing herself as a failure and letting go of that and entrusting her daughter to, you know, the only thing she has in the world to someone else. Yeah, and she she caps off the episode and the conversation with, take my heart when you go, which was the, the loving response that Kawana would give. Is this meant as the audience to know that she now has the full story and that she's indicating that to, to Aki or that they're now almost family that he's taken ownership of her daughter and the, and they're one i think it's the former i wouldn't i wouldn't go so far as the latter although he does invite them to you know her to find them if she ever gets out of there but i think it's more just a, it's an acknowledgement that i know your story now i understand your vernacular i get it the other important information that trans you know transfers there between the two is the knowledge now that dolores is the death bringer and she'll be the end of us all do we now think that with that information and Maeve is still connected out to all the hosts in the park, she can control them, she can assemble them, she can drive them in a direction? Now that she knows Dolores is the enemy, do we see this setting up for a final confrontation in the, in the last two episodes or in the finale? Well, some people have theorized that this is going to be a you know Jedi versus Sith sort of th- sort of thing. The the hosts awakened by love versus the hosts awakened by hatred. Again, that seems too simple. Every time we underestimate this show, they come back with something stronger. So I just don't, I just don't see it happening. I really hope not. One bigger idea, though, that they do seem to explore here, though, is Maeve's ability to communicate through her daughter. Now, I said that in the Instacast that it was probably because they they made the mistake of plugging her into the network, and so she was able to communicate. But that doesn't necessarily solve for the fact that the network itself is down. Now, granted, if she's got abilities far beyond the technology that they have, it could be that she can override that sort of thing. But there also could be a sort of a, a quantum 
connection between hosts. So if Maeve can has this one other entity that she can connect with, her daughter, and we've talked about pairing again between hosts, and if Aki, you know, he was able to make Koana see just by talking with her and, and having her, you know, touch his his chest and having a moment alone with her. If there is a pairing like that, it does make you wonder who Dolores's pair is. We haven't really seen that with Teddy or with Peter. And, and it makes you wonder, is there a, another character out there or has she bonded with Teddy? Is Teddy awake or has she bonded with Peter? Who is her, her pair? Well, well, you remember in, in all the other pairs you mentioned, there was, it was an origin. It was somebody that it went way back into their history. Teddy is a more recent relationship. Her father had been swapped in and out, you know, once at least that we know of. The person with the the, the most ties to Dolores would be Bernard. Mm-hmm. And if someone was going to bring that out of her and realize, I think he would be the one character. And when I mean Bernard, I mean Bernard Arnold, that combination, because even Ford says they have a strange effect on each other. Now, one of the benefits of hindsight when we do watch these episodes is getting to look back in the series and dig even into past seasons. And we looked back to Escalante. We saw the aftermath of the shooting at the gala. And that got me to thinking about the Journey into Night speech uh, that Ford makes. And we've assumed this whole time that Ford was talking about Dolores. But it seems like with this episode – it could be seen as Ford's speech was about Aki. Yeah, because we've always had somewhat of a problem believing that Dolores' actions were of free will. Bernard, you know, I think they're having a conversation in, in the cradle, and he says, you made Dolores shoot. And he said, no, I didn't make her, but I, I knew she was going to do it. So I, I don't think that could be that first trigger that Ford describes in his new narrative, uh, which is a murder by choice. So I'm leaning away from Dolores. Right. The exact words in his speech was, since I was a child, I've always loved a good story. I believe that stories helped us to ennoble ourselves, to fix what was broken in us, to help us become the people we dreamed of being. Lies that told a deeper truth. I always thought I could play some small part in that grand tradition. And for my pains, I got this, a prison of our own sins, because you don't want to change or cannot change because you're only human after all. But then I realized someone was paying attention, someone who could change. So I began to compose a new story for them. It begins with the birth of a new people and the choices they will have to make and the people they will decide to become. And we'll have all those things that you've always enjoyed. It begins in a time of war with a villain named Wyatt and a killing, this time by choice, surprises and violence. I'm sad to say this will be my final story. An old friend once told me that something that gave me great comfort. These violent delights have violent ends. And it goes on from there. Yeah, so the it begins in a time of war with a villain named Wyatt, period. Uh, that is the time of Dolores in the Wyatt character and the first incident at Escalante. That does not require that the following statement, a killing, this time by choice, has to refer to the Escalante incident. Right. I, I'm leaning more towards that killing of choice was Aki realizing something was going on. He had learned about the people below and he makes the choice. And it's the first one we've ever seen of a host. And he, the choice was for him to allow the cowboy to stab him. Yeah, it could be. And Ford in this episode shows that he has an acknowledgement of how Aki is different. He calls him a flower that grows in the dark. And I started thinking about it and I was like, if I was Ford and I had seen and met Aki would Dolores still be my big hope for advancement? Would this host that's still going about her loop be the one that I've signaled as as she's the one that's gonna that's gonna change all this? Or would my hope of seeing a conscious host reside with with Aki? Yeah, and it, and it just kind of crossed my mind that Doctor Ford's aware that Dolores is referenced as the Death Bringer. He has an opportunity at this point since he knows not necessarily the future exactly, but he has a good idea of how things will play out. Since the host can't die, does this mean she is the death bringer to humans? That her role in this new narrative is to get out of the park? That Dr. Ford's goals could be twofold. One is to allow uh, the new people, which is Aki and the, the woke hosts, and to eliminate the humans who he sees as not worthy and release the death bringer onto the world. 
it would seem to be a possibility considering that they made Wyatt a, a military leader. It's not just Dolores on a on a violent tilt. That it, this is actually somebody who is capable and skilled at killing, and at least we're told at military leadership. Yeah, and I, I, that makes me rethink my thought earlier on here that Maeve and Dolores are now on a collision course because they could both be true. Maeve could work with the new people, and she wouldn't mind if if. Dolores went out into the real world and made the humans suffer as long as uh, the hosts were allowed to thrive and, and develop and grow. One idea I did want to bring up, though, before we move on from, from the Aki storyline is the possibility that I said during the Instacast that he is the most reliable narrator that we've had. And we can see that there was, in fact, an Arnold that was, in fact, killed. We see the history of the park through 40 years through his eyes and assume that his head wasn't fiddled with. It is still entirely possible, I hope it's not the case, but you know, just to balance out the argument, that he is running completely on false memories, that he hasn't been around that long, that a lot of these things that we've never seen before are actually just implanted. We know from watching the show this long that any memory could be a false memory. And so, again, just to kind of throw things on their side – we should remember that he could be being used as an instrument just as well and may not be the chosen one that we think he is. Uh, if, if if they were to do that, they would completely undo all the goodwill and the happiness that they've uh, gotten out of their fans this week. Everyone's loving it because we finally got a compelling story that you know cleared the deck. You said, we need to know, let's get some sure footing. Where do we stand? What, what is has happened in the history. And we're using this to put a lot of the pieces in place. If this turns out now that this is fake, you know, with the revelation of the cradle, alternate realities, multiple timelines, if they give us something that they demonstrate as, as fact and we base our feelings on only to show us that's a lie, I think they're in danger of, of losing people and the goodwill that they just built up with this episode. Absolutely agree. It's It was refreshing to have something clear and something to hold on to in a, in a very uncertain sea that seemed to be this island that we at least could catch our breath, stop swimming for a second and go, okay, this is real and and sort of branch out from there. Uh, it even gave us some insight into what happened to Logan. Now, prior to this episode, the last we had seen of Logan or heard about Logan was William talking to James Delos, then saying that Logan had an overdose. Here we see Aki run into Logan. He's out with, it seems like, you know, heat exhaustion, some sun exposure and and that's where we encounter him. And I think it's important to go back to that scene uh, with Logan to re-examine it and see any other clues it could give us. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I, I know I got wrong was I was questioning he's been out there without water for you know, 24 hours. Uh, I don't know what the limit is that you can survive without fluids. And I thought it was odd that he would go from someone who loved the park, was having a good time to illogical ravings of a madman about water and about, I need to find a door, get out of here. This isn't the real world. So we were wondering whether or not he could be a host. To, I think even you said who'd hit a cognitive plateau. Right. Several people have written in nurses uh, and, and also researchers. I think we had a biologist too, who wrote into kind of trying to put this in perspective. And they said, essentially uh, being out there in the heat with the sun exposure, this, these are actually classic signs of dehydration exposure. Uh, one of the listeners, Dan Campbell wrote in and actually cited all of his stuff too. But he said, basically both people and horses can go anywhere from two days to a week without water before severe health consequences. Um, it, it was interesting that it does make you wonder that uh, a host horse, why would it die? But apparently it does. But essentially that Logan's mental state is consistent with exposure. Yeah, and it, not just exposure, but it explains the specific types of delusions that he's having. Uh, and that led me to the next bucket, which is the evolution of consciousness. Uh, and we've always questioned was it planned? Who started it? Why did it happen? Uh, and, and it kind of clicked this week, going back in, in the first episode of season one, uh, Ford is having a conversation and he says, evolution forged the entirety of sentient life on this planet using only one tool, the mistake. And that was in the premiere in The Origin. 
And I think Logan's scene was one of the key steps in that mistake slash misunderstanding that ultimately led to the host becoming awake. Right. And you pointed this out to me. And I, again, I completely missed this is Akicheta, when he goes back to that spot and he's looking for you know the door again, uh, he doesn't seem to see it. He says it wasn't visible to him. But at that moment, there seems to be an exchange of idea that pu- that implants the seed of that vision in his head from Logan. Yeah, and it made no sense to us. Why would Logan be talking about a door? And he's he's muttering about, you'll fucking drown, you're going to drown. And it hit me. Logan isn't mad. He's describing a mirage. He's sitting on the edge of a, of a dune. He's in, in the desert. Uh, and the dehydration mixed, he's having hallucinations of a body of water. And he's looking for a way out of this madness. He feels trapped in this hallucination. So the simplest explanation is it's a desert mirage with dehydration, and that leads him to say, I'm looking for the door, which then cracks something open in Aki that starts all the hosts in Aki down a path, which was simply a mistake. Right. And we see that throughout this episode. It's a series of very specific mistakes. And so it has to do with, you know, again, just the right music at the right time, the right deaths at the right time. Uh, the maze being placed in the bar at the right time, they all could be seen as, again, it kind of gets into the idea of like of like intelligent design, right? Uh, was there a divine hand moving all this, or is it just happenstance that all the pieces were just there at the right time uh, to to kind of create this, this situation? Some people will have, have mentioned that it seems odd that a host would be able to just roam around like that. Again, but I think it takes all those pieces plus an above- average host to make it happen yeah and that and that realization and that that trigger that logan's uh, ramblings wouldn't have been possible without one simple lazy mistake by a tech uh, when they first pull in aki and he's just living the pastoral life and he's, he's with the peaceful tribe and they said the ford wants to have something new and exciting for the grand opening the techs are lazy and he said you know what am I going to do? Do I do all new dialogue trees? Who the fuck's going to help me with this rebuild of his entire heuristic base? And they just decide out of laziness to leave the old shit in there. Now, I believe it's the first time we've heard the term heuristic base. Am I right? Right. I mean, at least on the show, uh, you know, from a, from a marketing perspective, heuristics are, are, are becoming common vernacular. But in the context of Westworld, uh, again, they're bringing in something that has you know, real life application in the sense of we talk about databases and predictive analytics and machine learning. Here's another sort of a a current buzzword that is being introduced into Westworld. Yeah. And we've seen demonstrations of the first half of the text discussion, the dialogue tree, which is, you know, it's the narrative essentially that lays out a a question response tree for all of the hosts. If a, a host is asked this question, they can give this answer. It's Kind of like the build your own mystery, those novels that they used to have when you were a kid, you know, Scooby-Doo and Shaggy. Do you enter into the into the uh, haunted mansion? Yes. Turn to page 85. It's like that. But the heuristic technique, it's the problem solving and learning or discovery that employs a practical method, not guaranteed to be optimal or perfect, but sufficient to reach an immediate goal. So where we find an optimal solution is impossible and practical. Uh, the heuristic method can be used to speed up the process of finding a satisfactory solution, allowing maybe that one original heuristic base built by Arnold in Aki allows for a new way of problem solving. And we presented with something that's strange, Logan on the tree talking about a door it causes his brain to start to develop new pathways and solutions in a heuristic manner that, that isn't present in all the other hosts. Right. And they make the comment when he does finally allow himself to be killed and, and, and go in that he's been out there you know, nearly a decade and what they call the, the meat grinder there. So it seems like that, that protocol of not updating a host until it's killed and brought into the shop is a really reasonable way to function, right? That, that, 
why would they go up and gather them randomly and bring them in and update them? Just do it, you know, when they get killed because they're getting killed all the time. It again is a testament to how how brutal this world is. And as we know, evolution seems to flourish in a brutal environment. So it's essentially the equivalent of having a uh, a survival of the fittest, but in this case, it's a survival of the fittest that allows somebody to almost reverse evolve into a new species. Yeah, and that darkness that Doctor Ford later references that they've been growing in the dark was was what allowed them to actually become sentient and develop. If they were aware that Aki was out, had not been updated, had survived for nine years, they would have gone out, searched him out, cleared him out, or put him into cold storage with uh, Koana. So growing in the dark, although it wasn't ideal for for Aki, was what allowed them to survive. And, And I think that the evolution of AI in Westworld was not a master plan. There was nobody behind it. Even though Ford you know, mentions how Arnold's theory was the pyramid or that it was a, a circle, and they let us know that they still don't know what's going on. They can't explain it. And that's why Ford couldn't replicate it, because it was something that wasn't uh, wasn't created by them. In the end, it was consciousness. Was a re- it was a result of one lazy tech the misunderstanding of a delusional conversation and, and statement that Logan makes about a door mixed with uh, the misunderstanding of a child's puzzle in Escalante that starts Aki down the, the path of becoming aware himself and the sheer luck of surviving nine years in the park is what gets us to this point. And it's exactly what Ford mentions that the, The greatest tool that evolution has is the mistake. And again, a callback to season one. A lot of people said that this episode didn't move forward, but I think it did a great job of fleshing out things from the past. Yeah, you said it didn't advance the plot. I think it answered a lot of the questions that we had from season one. We were disappointed to learn that the maze, it was based on a child's game. We were like, how lame is that? That's stupid. But now it makes sense that the maze wasn't created by Ford or Bernard for Dolores. It was a misunderstanding of an actual game. So it it was right. It was stupid and it didn't make sense. We wondered how could uh, the the maze be imprinted under the scalps? We learned now that that was placed there by the true believers of the nation to become a, aware so that they wouldn't be able to forget. So as much as it didn't advance the plot in present day, it helped fill in and explain some of those questions we had in season one. I thought that was a really beautiful part of the episode. And I was surprised that for some people, especially a few YouTube listeners, that that was lost on them. Was they were like, what? So they're just tattooing it on the inside of their heads. What's that all about? And that the, uh, the Lakota brave, I mean, he clearly says the ghost nation brave, he says, you know, they don't want him to lose it. They don't want to be able to have it taken away. They need to hide it somewhere. And he's willing as a, as an inherent to the faith, essentially to have it, put on the inside of his of his scalp somewhere where it won't be found. And 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 that and that seems to ring true because after QA arrives, they're surprised to find it there. It's not like Delos was aware of this imprint. Yeah, and I think it's it's making the the, the issues that we had with season 1 a lot more palatable. And I know they're correction that they didn't think this out in season 1, but at least they're explaining it in a logical way that uh, advances the plot. Another complaint about this episode people had was, again, Aki moving around freely inside of the Mesa. Uh, In the Instacast, you guessed that possibly he had some inside help, that it was Ford kind of allowing him to move around freely. And I think there's a lot of evidence in that. Yeah, going back again, because my first take on it was, it's not plausible. It just, you know, the, the path was clear for him to make it from you know, the chair with the tax down a cold source. I was like, this can't happen. So in going back and watching it a little more closely and with some detail, the techs are shocked to find out that Aki has not been updated in, in almost a decade. And they call down the boss and they're expecting the boss to immediately say, hey, you know, you got to put this host in cold storage. Is, we can't have this host out there. There's a momentary pause where the boss who i would imagine is the the head of behavioral because this is a situation you would call for that position they're expecting her to say you know wipe them she says nope just give him the updates and push him back into service 
conveniently, immediately, the two lazy techs, you know, pre Sylvester and, and Felix, mention it's going to take four hours. Uh, let's go take a break. When everyone is out of the way, is when almost on command, Aki wakes up and he's making his way directly from the tech's chair to cold storage to find Koana and the other tribe members lost. There's no logical explanation that would get him from point A to point B, then back without being seen or stopped and to know the path to go. Somebody had to have been helping him. Right. And people have said, oh, well, maybe, you know, being a, a, a supreme warrior as he is, he's using some sort of ninja skills. No, this guy is walking in the middle of hallways. They're completely illuminated. He's not wearing any sort of disguise. Uh, and we've seen, again, through all of season one and season two, there are multiple layers of security, access codes. You can't just walk around. This is highly protected stuff. Cold storage isn't easy to access. It's not just out there in the open. So it is highly improbable that he would be able to make this journey, let alone know where to go, uh, without some sort of help. No, because you can be a great warrior out in the open plains and and combat in the, the world of Lakota, but... This is a foreign world. He gets on an escalator. Could you imagine a a Native American from the Old West confidently navigating a futuristic glass tech chamber and then down an escalator? He seems like he's not questioning the world he's in. And that leads me to believe that, that Ford, who says he's been watching him since the beginning, may have been aware that he was out there and decided to give a little push. But there's no way that could have happened organically. Right. Another thing that seems a little out of place in this episode was Ford's conversation uh, with Aki uh, in the middle of the night on that bear scene. Whenever a host is triggered to awake, because it's one of the commands, you know, they say Ford is the one who put us to sleep. Ford wakes up Aki and summons him to a meeting. Did you get a vibe? This could be VR or some kind of uh, other encounter that wasn't in the real world. It did have a surreal quality to it, the way that it was lit. Also, just the idea of Ford being out in the park at night by himself with a frozen scene, uh, getting his hands bloody, cutting the scalps off of hosts. Uh, it just seemed out of place. Now, every other time we've seen this sort of work done, you have teams come out, retrieve what it is that they're working on and bring them back. Now, it might be that Ford was attempting to operate you know, in secrecy and didn't want people in, to see him. And again, it looked like he was inspecting the scalp, so it would explain why he was out there. But something about it had a dreamlike state to it as well. Yeah, it's, it's an implausible situation. You know, when, when the text froze the scene with Rebus and, and Walter uh, with the milk for growing boy in season one, it was the aftermath of a shootout. It made sense. There was some some guests that were frozen inside uh, the general store. Did Ford just happen to walk up at the point where a, a, a giant black bear or grizzly is on his hind legs surrounded? It, it seemed like it was a staged scene for Aki, less just a, a, a random you know, situation that Ford came up and, and froze all motor functions. That would have been believable if it was something around the campfire, around the camp. Was he trying to convey a message to Aki by staging this dramatic scene that would be familiar to him? Yeah, I didn't really understand it. I, I kept pouring over it for the symbolism there, right? Does the bear mean anything? And I'm sure we'll get telegraph emails explaining what it is, but I was more taken with the dialogue itself, the the notion of of Aki being this this flower in the dark, and then Ford showing sort of a a seemingly benevolent hand and giving him some guidance and helping along in understanding the world around him. And then giving that prophetic line of, about the Deathbringer uh, coming for him. I thought that it was, it was beautifully written and I was very moved by it, but I didn't quite understand the placement of every specific thing in the scene. Yeah. Hopefully that's one thing we'll, we'll get to see going forward. But um, like a lot of the, the rest of this episode, it was visually just gorgeous. It was, some of the best cinematography, some of the best visuals that the show has provided us. And it leaves me optimistic for a final two great episodes in the season and season three going forward. 
Certainly a lot to think about, uh, a lot to chew on, and we eagerly await your telegraphs at host at shoutontv.com to explain more of what you saw in this episode. I think everyone was very gripped by this episode. Uh, and even what we've gotten from the Instacast so far, uh, there's been some really, really heavy hitters. So can't wait to do the telegraph with you guys on Friday. Uh, before we close out, I'd like to send a couple shout outs. If you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, please go to shoutontv.com. Uh, and fill out the form that asks for your name for a shout out, and we'll read it right here on the podcast. This week's shout outs go to Rob Conlin, Grunt Pile, Bernard, Bernard from the UK and Switzerland, Yen Hom, Matt E, David, Aaron, Joe Fritz S, Frass, Joe Pontrelli, and Suzanne from Tucson, fellow Arizonan. Hello to you, Suzanne. Uh, that's it for shout outs this week. If you'd like to hear your name on the podcast, again, go to shoutontv.com and hit the shout outs up and we will read your name on the podcast. Also, a lot of people have written in and given great feedback on Simon sharing his music on the podcast. We played at the end of the Instacast. He's been gracious enough to send us another song. Uh, if you'd like to check him out, uh, we will have his contact information in the show notes. Uh, but Simon, thanks a lot for your music. People are really enjoying that. That concludes this week's episode of Shout on TV Westworld. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shout on TV. On Facebook, search for Shout on TV Podcasts. The website is shoutontv.com. Our email address is hosts at shoutontv.com. And we're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a kind review that helps the podcast grow. Also, if you want to hear us loosen up a little bit, uh, if you enjoy the pod, maybe you're sick of Westworld, uh, check us out at ShatTheMovies.com, uh, where we do 80s and 90s movie reviews. Our most recent one was Showgirls. Coming up next will be Big Trouble in Little China. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, Roger Roper, and Carrie Gross, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us on Friday for the Westworld Telegraph and listen through the end of this episode to hear another song from Simon. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you at the Mesa. Thank you.